Hello everyone, my name is Christian. Welcome back to Tech Point. Today our guest is Sam, the founder of Breaking B2B. Hello, Sam. Hey Christian, thanks for having me on, man. Looking forward to it. Thank you for joining our podcast. At first, please tell us what you do. Yeah, 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 sure thing. So Sam Dunning, I run Breaking B2B and in short, we work with B2B and SaaS companies that are perhaps a little annoyed, a little frustrated, a little tired of seeing competitors consistently ahead of them in organic Google search results. So as a result, they're probably not getting a steady stream of organic demos or leads or calls booked through their website and also missing out on Mindshare, as many of us know when it comes to B2B, especially in, in more higher ticket offers or more complex offerings, especially in SaaS as we go up to mid-market and enterprise. It's rare that someone goes on your website once and then decides to book a sales call. We know there's a lot more involved in the B2B buying process. So we help focus client, help dream clients get, get mind share through organic search and drive demos. I also run a podcast under the same name, Breaking B2B, where we're, we've just hit 400 episodes, actually. So we interview SaaS marketing leaders. I also do solo episodes and we cover topics like what's working for fast growth marketers today and they share their tips and likewise nice. i share seo tips website tips and go to market ideas along with experiments on the, on the weekly podcast so that's that's what i'm up to and how uh, and why are you breaking the b2b what what's what's up with the name <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it came to, i think it just came to me one day because i i've been in web and seo agencies for the best part of 12 13 years this company i fired up the start of this year and mm -hmm. i think I was basically s sick of BS because there's so many agencies that say things like SEO needs to be six to 12 months. You need to be locked into this massive contract paying thousands and thousands and thousands a month. And I was like, it's not necessarily true. And this is some of the stuff we can talk about. You don't have to invest for, for months or even years to see results with SEO for your SaaS. There are quicker wins where you can see results inside 90 days. And yeah, there's there's a lot of BS in B2B marketing, and I, I like to to bust some of the myths, run experiments yes. myself, and share with our audience what works, what doesn't, and what's fluff. So mm -hmm. that that's my mindset. I'm quite straight talking into the point. So I thought yeah. breaking B2B fitted for the for the brand. <laughs> and how how specifically do you help companies? And let's start with the basics. What type of companies need your service? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We originally we were quite broad. So we were B2B service and B2B tech. These days, it's usually B2B SaaS companies. And those companies either tend to have a, they might be early stage with a decent round of funding. So maybe they've just had 750K, a million round of funding. Mm -hmm. Or they're turning over, maybe they're bootstrapped, but they're turning over a million, two million plus minimum. Uh, many of the companies a bit larger. And they've probably got, they've got a knowledge of, of SEO usually when they come to us. So they've perhaps got one or two marketers in house. Um, or maybe they're just building out their marketing function. And probably up to now, they've invested a lot of cash, time, or resource into outbound sales, as, as well as paid ads, paid media. And probably they've grown a lot through the network, maybe the founder's network or the VCs or the, found, uh, the funding team's network. But they've probably realized that they, they've neglected organic search quite heavily, which is quite often the case from our experience with B2B SaaS companies. And they are, they do have those problems. Like they are constantly seeing their competitors ahead of them in Google when they're searching for their offer, comparing them to alternatives, searching for the problems they fix. And they think, well, we're missing quite a big slice of the pie on Google organic search. So that's usually around the time when, when folks kind of seek out our help. Perhaps they listen to my podcast or see me on LinkedIn or they find us through Google search. And that's usually where we get involved and see if we can help. Is inbound better than outbound? <sighs> It's, it's, a, it's a good question. And I'm probably one of those sick marketers that actually thinks outbound is alive and well. So I, there's so, I mean, I get sick and tired of it, Christian, seeing kind of diehard yeah. demand gen marketers and diehard inbound marketers just saying that outbound sales is so annoying. Like no one wants a cold call. No one wants a cold email. No one wants to receive a package in the mail. And I'm one of those sick marketers that is very much an all, all bound strategy. I think if your target market, if your ICP, if your focus client is receptive to this channel, doesn't matter if it's a cold call, cold email, doesn't matter if it's a podcast that's relevant to your industry, doesn't matter if it's Google search, if they're receptive to it, then let's leverage it. If it's a channel that our, our target audience is consuming, then 
at the end of the day, these are just channels to distribute content or a message. Yes. Um, so many marketers are like cold calling's dead, all this stuff. Well, one of the experiments I ran recently for my own business was cold calling CMOs and VPs of marketing. I do that once or twice a week instead of messing around on LinkedIn and, and we book appointments from it, just like we book appointments from inbound SEO. Like they both work. It's just whether you're testing it properly and your audience is receptive to it. What do you say are the top three biggest mistakes that SaaS companies make when it comes to their marketing? Sure. So I'll, I'll tune these ra rather greedily. I'll tune these into kind of what we offer around websites and SEO. So probably the first one, if we start from an SEO standpoint for SaaS, mistake wise, it's probably treating SEO as a, as a tick box exercise. So what I mean by that is historically, from my experience, SaaS websites, especially when they're early stage, are quite light on content. So they've probably got maybe five, six or so pages like home, features, results, maybe a blog, book a demo. Yeah. Just that very basic core set of pages, which is fine, especially if you're bootstrapped, you've probably got a limited time or resource to build out your website. And then when they take on board their first marketing hire, They've probably already invested a bit into things like maybe events, paid ads, maybe done some influencer stuff, some partnership. And then when they eventually scrape some budget or resource for, for SEO, the marketers probably already got a hundred other things on their plate. So they've probably said to the marketer that they've just hired, like, we've, I keep seeing competitors above us in organic search. I want to start kind of getting some traffic from SEO. So can you do some SEO? And the marketer hears that and thinks, well, I've got 99 other jobs this week to do. But yeah, I'll do a little bit of SEO and see how we go. So they yeah. probably jump onto a keyword tool or an SEO tool like Hrefs or SEMrush, look for a high volume, high traffic keyword. So maybe that's an information based keyword like what is industry term or how to do something relevant to our yes. industry. Then they chuck that how to query into an AI tool like ChatGPT, pump out a blog on the topic think, yeah, that looks okay. Stick it on the website and then get back to their 98 other tasks for the week. And then a couple of months go by, the founder or their exec will go like, how did SEO go? The marketer will say, yeah, I did some SEO. I did a blog like you told me to. And they might ask, well, how many leads did that blog get? And they'll say, well, well, none. You didn't ask me to get any leads from my SEO. You just said, quote unquote, do some SEO. I did some SEO, got a little bit of traffic. And sadly, it's that's the, the problem with, it, with that is that there's no foundational research, i.e. you're doing SEO the wrong way around. You're looking yep. at high traffic keywords instead of understanding like what is what are my dream clients searching <laughs> for specifically on Google when they're ready to have a sales conversation around my offer? Yes. Like, are they searching for a specific type of software, a specific type of tool? Are they comparing us to our competitors? Are they looking for a very crisp and specific problem we fix? Are they stuck with an obstacle? That's where we should start, i.e. bottom of the funnel, sales ready prospects, not informational how-to queries that are generic that can be answered by a robot. So that, that's one of the juiciest mistakes with SEO. Um, and we can go into how to fix that if you wish. The second mistake is probably website-wise, and this is not just SaaS, but this is for B2B in general. So websites are built for ego, i.e. what the exec team, what the founder team, maybe what the funding team think looks good, sounds cool, or is going to work instead of what dream clients actually care about. And B2B SaaS homepages are especially guilty of this. So you might land on a SaaS homepage and it will say like, we're the turbocharged all-in-one revenue program to 20x your cash flow this quarter. And you read that headline, you're like, well, it sounds like they help us generate money. I'm not sure what the tool actually does for my business. And then you scroll down the homepage past the hero area and you're still like scratching your head like, I've no idea what these guys exactly. actually do yeah. with their software. <laughs> yeah. And it turns out the, the kind of leadership team are just trying to sound cool or trying to talk about how great they are or, the, or maybe they even talk about the funding round they've just had on their homepage. And it's like, well, if I'm an ideal prospect and I've just landed on your site perhaps from an ad, or from social, or I've been referred over. Like I want to quickly understand what you do. I want to understand how it helps me. I want to understand why you, because there's usually three or four vendors that I'm going to compare, like what's your differentiator, and then see some proof of results and then fl flick through your website once I've got that understood through your homepage. Whereas so many, 
I guess so many, especially early stage founders get caught up in their own hype. So they think they have to shout about how great they are or how cool they are or weave an AI to every other word and that kind of stuff. When really your prospects want to know clearly what you do, why you and how it helps them and then navigate the rest of your site, then navigate pricing, results, your demo and so on. So that, that's another huge mistake, like building for ego instead of what dream clients care about. And that's reinforced by doing customer research. Okay. Uh, and let's say, let's take an example. A customer comes to you. What are the first steps that, uh, that you implement? How does the process work? Yeah. 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 So for example, if they were coming to us to, for help with SEO, then research basically. So if, okay. if they, if they're brought in the SEO as a channel that they want to ramp up, so it's understanding like, who is your dream client? Like, who are we going after? Is it, are you targeting tech companies, HR, finance, whatever? What size of business? Is there a specific um, job title we're going after? And then we'll understand things like who are the main top three, four, five competitors in the market? So we can research their strategies, see how well they're ranking, how their website's structured and so on and so forth, and any gaps in their strategy that we can double down on. One I love to ask in our onboarding process and our onboarding calls and forms is what's the main top two or top three problems you fix? You'll be amazed how many how many marketers, how many founders don't know the problems they fix for their dream clients. So I'll ask what problem do you fix? And they'll say, we help by do this. So we've got this feature. I'll say that's a benefit or an outcome. That's not a problem. A problem is in a frustration. Like in my yes. case, prospects are frustrated. They're tired of seeing competitors above them in Google. Or they're really annoyed that their website isn't converting hard-earned traffic into inbound leads or demos. That's a problem. And then I want to know the impact of that problem um, and the root cause. And also, I like to know the tipping point. I mm -hmm. What's the tipping point the prospects get to where they're so frustrated that they then start to seek out a solution like yours? So, for example, in the CRM space, it might be that in-house they've got all these like the common common in-house way of doing it, DIY, do it yourself, is Google Sheets or Excel. Yeah. Like Google yeah. Sheets or Excel or the is leads. the enemy to, to, to most SaaS or software. So it's like, well, for example, if you sell to finance, they might be like, well, these finance teams are got all these messy Google Sheets that are taking like three hours of admin a day. And if they were actually to move over to our software, they'd like to save themselves this much time. It actually affects churn because like pros the folks in-house get really annoyed with this process. Um, and eventually they get so tired, they think there must be a better way. And that's when they Google like how to do, I don't know, annual accounts on Excel yes. sheets. And then they see our blog and then we show them there's a better way of getting this, sh getting this shit done. Exactly. So that's, exactly. That's a, a really useful exercise, not just for SEO, but for, for marketing in general to know like how, how folks do it now when they get so annoyed that they get that tipping point of seeking out new solutions and then what the, the new better world or the new better outcome is. Um, and then, of course, things like how prospects, how dream customers describe their offer, how they describe the end results, because all this stuff help with our, helps with our keyword research. So you can make sure we're actually showing up for relevant terms that their dream clients are searching for. And likewise, it helps our content team. If we're crafting articles or landing pages or comparison pages, we can speak to real problems, um, real goals, real outcomes. Yes. So those are some, some things we like to ask. And, and I'm curious about your service, basically. Is it more like a, an advisory role or more like a do it for you a type of program? Mix of both, really. Okay. So, yeah, so some, I suppose, some more established, larger scale teams, more enterprise teams might already have a marketing team, might already be doing SEO, and they want mm -hmm. us to fill the gaps. So they'll mm -hmm. say, look, can you, can you assess our current strategy? give us some pointers here and there and probably sharpen our skill set and our, our process. Whereas smaller teams that maybe have only got a marketing team of two, three, four or smaller, we'll, we'll do everything. So we'll, we'll come in, we'll review the current strategy, if any. We'll double down on those points I talked about around customer research. Then we'll say, look, well, this is what we want to start showing up for, for bottom of funnel team terms that are going to drive demo requests fast. And this is the wider strategy long term. And then we'll start building out the website content building out the pages, building website authority with backlinks and, and so forth and kind of building out a, a solid, solid strategy and plan. And they also create a podcast for companies? We do. Yeah, we, we do podcasts for, for some B2B companies as well. So How does after, this work? I'm, I'm really curious. <laughs> mainly through my own pain and, and learnings, really, because I've been running my show, Breaking B2B, for over four years now. 
and you'll probably know yourself, Christian, like it's, it's quite a lot of work to organize guests. If you do solo episodes to prepare, script those out, shoot them, produce them, get Edit. upload them to YouTube, to the audio channels, then promote them on socials, get the guests, the promotional pack. And at the same time, also make sure that the, the podcast has some kind of outcome for your business, whether that is like an account-based management, ABM play to interview target prospects, whether that is to interview famous people in your niche, whether it's more of a solo episode play where you just want to show hands-on expertise that you're kind of the go-to in your industry and, and share actionable tips or an educational entertainment. There's a lot of plays. So it was it, it kind of came naturally because my friend um, works with me that, that produces our show. We thought like we've learned the hard way of what works, what definitely doesn't. We might as well kind of offer this as an additional service to some of the B2B and SaaS companies that could benefit. And it's someone from their team that is the host of the podcast? someone from the the team that we like the the, the company we help yes usually is best if it's usually best if it's someone with some kind of expertise so that could yep. be could totally be the found, could be the founder yeah but they might be super busy but ideally someone that's got expertise specifically within their within their industry otherwise it might be difficult for them to talk to points i suppose you could get away with guest interviews but then you might struggle to ask meaningful questions <laughs> that's right and uh, do you organize everything for them or is it more like uh, here's how to do it program i mean how much effort they put into these uh, podcasts yeah it's more getting them set up so yep. one devising a strategy like what are mm -hmm. the end outcomes you want from the podcast like do you want to build an audience do you want to drive leads do you want to do abm um getting them set up on the software and tools make sure they're comfortable with that getting a cadence. Are we doing one a week, two a week? Are we doing one a month? Something that's workable and feasible for their founder or their subject yes. matter expert. Yes. And then setting them up on the flow, really. Like how are we going to record them? All right, we're going to record them on Riverside or Zoom or whatever. Drop them into a Google Drive. This is going to be the format that we're going to do. This is going to be the style. We're going to brand it up like this. We're going to build out the podcast name so it's actually searchable within YouTube or searchable within the podcast channels. Um, and then ongoing, how are we going to promote it, distribute it? kind of get it out to guests and all that good stuff. That's amazing. And for companies that you work with, I guess it's more like a long-term partnership, right? Not just a couple of months and that's it. I think you are like a constant uh, fractional CMO or how do you call it? <laughs> yeah, m most of the time. I mean, we do, for example, with SEO, we sometimes come in for like 90-day sprints where we'll just agree a, a piece of work. So we'll say, look, we're going to, for example, a SaaS might come to us and say, well, we really want to hit some bottom of funnel keywords and ramp up our site authority. So I'll say, look, this, I'm going to help you research exactly what your prospects are searching for when they're seeking out solutions like yours on Google or comparing you to alternatives. We're going to drill down to those. We're going to pump out over these three months X amount of assets, i.e. blog articles, landing pages, comparison pages, and we're going to build up some authority with some really solid niche relevant links. So they might do that as like a 90-day sprint. Um, but usually folks kind of get a feel for working with us and, and most of the time we like to think they're fairly happy so then they'll go on to more longer term venture if they need it or start doing it and ramping up in house. And how do you find your own clients? All sorts, man. So naturally through SEO. So a lot of folks will search for our offerings, like B2B SEO agency and stuff like that on Google. Mm -hmm. But aside from our kind of eating our own dog food from SEO, LinkedIn, yeah. So I post daily content, educational, funny, silly, stupid stuff on LinkedIn <laughs> around SEO and websites. I run the podcast. So some people find us through the podcast, Breaking B2B or on the YouTube um, referrals. So you have complimentary of companies mouth. that send work our way. And I run experiments quite a lot as well. So, for example, I talk, touched on briefly, briefly that we started cold calling like CMOs and VPs of marketing to see if they're receptive. And they were that. We do a little bit of that, a little bit of cold email. Um, and then every now and then I'll, I'll just try something a bit more unusual. Like we, we ran a series recently on LinkedIn called Ask the Public, where I just grab a microphone and, and ask folks on, the, on nearby towns and cities like what they think <laughs> SEO means or what makes a terrible website or what the marketers <laughs> actually do. And it, it gets some really funny reactions. It's just ways to stay top of mind, both on yes. LinkedIn and socials and and also stand out because yes. so many B2B brands are scared to do stuff that's different. 
obviously I run my business, so I'm, I'm very free in the sense that I can do unusual stuff and see what works and what doesn't. I, I, I'll uh, really like to, to chat about uh, this topic a bit. Why do you think brands are uh, afraid to try these crazy marketing ideas? I, I mean, the bigger they get, the more typical yeah, that's, the that's it, isn't marketing it? is, right? Especially as you get mid-market and enterprise. There's there's so much red tape, man. Like things things move so slowly, usually because there's so many management departments within these kind of companies, like sign-off after sign-off after sign-off. So I think smaller... And I say that I talk to this a lot about SEO as well, that the fact that smaller teams, startups with less red tape can make so much more of a dent, especially on things like SEO, because from an SEO standpoint, they can get they can go from idea like we're going to target this keyword. We're going to build this page to publish page within a few days. Whereas if you're a larger scale company, it might take weeks to get sign off on a keyword, build out the content, pass it to the web dev team, pass it to the design team, get approval five months later you might have a published page and it's the same for me with kind of my concepts that i do for my youtube or for my podcast or for linkedin i can come up with a wacky idea that i might have seen (laughs) someone in b2c do on youtube like if you that's where i get some of my ideas from my d2c stuff on tiktok and youtube and i can just put it into play and scrappy startups with where they can just speak to the founder and say look i've got this crazy idea and it is relevant to our product like we can link it to our offer and they might just say yeah let's go for it Whereas obviously when you, when you get into bigger organizations, there's a lot more approvals and they're a lot lot more risk averse, let's say. I, I, I totally understand that. And I'm curious to know about your journey. How did you start in B2B marketing? If you can walk us through your career after finishing your studies and uh, share the story. Didn't really study. Didn't really study much, to be fair. A lot of my learnings are from experience. So I... Although I suppose the podcast could be, so I'll give you the kind of shorter, less boring version. But (laughs) I was, so from about 18, I worked in a shop that UK folks would know as Jessup's, basically sold camera equipment Mm -hmm. because I did -hmm. did media studies at college. Then after that, at 18 or so, I went into selling cameras and video cameras because I thought it'd be really fun because I was into media. Turns out I hated it. I hated dealing with the general public, working in a retail shop and basically being abused around the clock, like asking people like, hi, how are you doing? Can I help? And I'm just saying like, no, you can't go away. And after a year of that, I had enough. And my cousin at the time said there was a job going at a web agency and did the interview the next day. They said, yeah, come on board. And I just walked out the retail shop, had enough. So got into that and basically came in this small web agency as a jack of all trades. So did some sales, did some project management, work with the development team offshore. So really, really threw me in at the deep end. I'd never really sold anything over the phone and went to to kind of telephone sales like on my first day, calling leads and stuff like that. So it was a really good way. Like if you want to learn marketing, I strongly encourage someone to work at a startup. Like everything's going at full steam 100% and you're probably the same with this, Christian. I expect you can speak to this. (laughs) But you're stressed like crazy, but you learn like crazy. And it, when you're in those kind of environments, it just forces you to sink or swim, really. And you just yes. ask folks questions all the time, like, how do you do this? Or what does, how does this work? And things like that. Like One of the quickest ways you can get hands-on experience for a couple of years, like super, super good learning. So yeah, I did that for some time. A bit of sales, a bit of project management, almost a bit of everything, learning the ropes around websites, SEO, and digital marketing. And then... Fast forward a few years, kind of did that, worked at another marketing agency, came back to that web agency. I was a co-director for three years. And then as I was doing that, from 2020, I started my own show. So I started the Breaking Beat podcast, which was named something different. Initially, I did that. Initially, I did it very selfishly. So I did it to learn from smart folks, but not it wasn't B2B marketing focused back then. So I spoke to entrepreneurs, sales leaders, business owners, marketers, like anyone that I respected that I thought they're going to share good insights to me and the audience around not just marketing, but growing a business, how to sell, how to build a team, whatever. Um, and then after a while, I thought, well, this is great. And I've learned loads, literally like university on steroids. Like I've got several degrees that I've not had to pay a penny for apart from my yes. time and some podcast equipment I'm sure you're the same yes. kind of running a podcast yes so 
And then I thought kind of a couple years in, like 2022, I thought I should probably try and monetize this podcast. Like I'm spending a lot of time. I should probably try and get something off the back end. So then we fine tuned it with a B2B marketing focus. I thought I'll start doing solo episodes where I talk about kind of SEO. I talk about the channels I'm running, like how to grow, build a great B2B website that converts and all that kind of stuff. And likewise, let's start interviewing SaaS and B2B marketing practitioners, VPs of marketing, CMOs, demand gen leaders. And not only can they share battle-tested advice that I can grill them on and learn from and share with their audience, but they might be good prospects for us over time, or they might be able to connect us to new potential partners to work with. Um, and also, as you know, podcasting was a great pillar piece of content to rep replay into video clips, blog articles, long form video snippets, and, and much, much more. And that's where I really decided that I wanted to double down on B2B marketing and eventually B2B SaaS. Um, mainly through my own pain points, like trying to sell. If you try to sell SEO, which I did for many, many years, if you try to sell SEO and websites to super small businesses outside of B2B, it's a constant battle. You need to educate and kind of sell the value of SEO to folks yeah. that have never heard of the word. Yes. <laughs> Whereas if you go into B2B SaaS companies, they're already clued up on SEO. And I, when you can speak to the pain points of not neglecting it and speak to the pain points of the value of investing in it, it makes life so much easier. And then when you back up your marketing play by educating and entertaining the audience, in my case, podcast, LinkedIn, and so more, so forth, it builds up a bit of an ecosystem. So that's a bit of a, a, a short version of the story. And then, yeah, fired up breaking B2B start of this year. We've just been steadily growing things since, really. And is there a team together or is it a one, uh, one person show? <laughs> yeah, so we're super, trying to stay, just because I'm trying to learn from the mistakes of my last agency, trying to stay super, super lean. So I'm the founder. It's, it's just me, but I have a team of, of trusted contractors because I've been, for my sins, because I've been doing this for years and years and years, I've built up a, a small one-page team of kind of specialist content writers, technical SEOs, web devs, that I can really rely on so I can make sure when we're taking on board clients, we've got a crack team that I tend to be the point of contact now. That might change when we grow. Um, but until we hit our year one goals, then I'm, I'm keeping super lean. What, what are your future plans? You mentioned this, uh, but I'm curious now about your, your goals. Do you want to transfer it into an agency really big or yeah? I've, Cause I've worked in kind of bigger agencies. So I'm, I'm not sure if we want to go down that route is the, is a transparent answer. That's so what I'm for now, I, yeah, for now I quite enjoy this. Like I do have definitely have monthly recurring revenue goals, which we're kind of slowly chipping away at steadily. Will I build out a team? Possibly, but it won't be a massive agency style. Certainly not for the first couple of years. I think we'll slowly build out our team over the course of 2025. Um, but for now, because I've dealt with the pains of growing a big agency, I like the idea that staying lean I like being flexible. The fact that I can do the podcast, I can mess around with content, can spend some time with the fam, with my son, and can still enjoy it. Because I think it's very easy to get sucked into running a business or running an agency, running a B2B service company, and just it all consuming. Which you do yes. need to have days where you spend tons. You do need to have days where you double down and spend loads of hours, which I do too. But you also need to be able to kind of have that flexible lifestyle, which and running a business. Otherwise, what's the point? Exactly. And probably if you scale, uh, you have no time to run the podcast, to do the mm. SEO yourself or to do what really passionates you. You become mostly a manager. That's it. That's it. And I, I do like being a bit hands on. So it's, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see where we go. What would be your best piece of advice for a SaaS company looking to focus on SEO today? Research, really. So like I say, there's so many easily made mistakes on SEO and there's so much random advice on LinkedIn. So the best thing that you can do really is either if you can do it yourself, take time to understand because let's face it, most SaaS, if they're going to invest in SEO, they want to drive either signups, if they're PLG, free trials, or they're going to want to drive demos or sales calls, depending yeah. if they're more sales-led. So we want to really understand what is someone searching for specifically when they need your offer, i.e. if you're selling calendar scheduling tools, that might be best calendar scheduling software or 
Calendly alternatives or Chili Piper alternatives or Revenue Hero alternatives or those kind of really what we call quote unquote money keywords. Like, let's take the time to understand what are our target prospects searching when they have a, a need for our offer and start at that bottom of the funnel, work up and then realize, take the time to understand what type of content is going to rank for that. How can we surpass? How can we beat the content that's currently ranking for that? And how can we build up our authority to show Google that we're a worthwhile site to rank? And that might be something you can do yourself as a founder. Like there's so much content and media out there to learn this stuff. Or it might be something you want to employ the, the help of an expert to, to get it right. And on the other side, what would be your best piece of advice for a starting marketer in 2024? Someone like me, like yourself, when you're just starting out, looking to get into this B2B marketing world. Yeah. So I would say learn from like learn from someone that's actually been where you want to go. There's so many talking heads on podcasts, LinkedIn, stuff like that, that chat stuff like cold calling's dead, ABM's dead, cold email's dead, but they haven't tried it specifically themselves. Um, so learn from someone who's actually been or already done what you're trying to do. So maybe they're now, maybe they started as a marketing exec 10 years ago and now they're a CMO. Yeah, talk to them because they've actually done the route you want to take if that is the route you want to take or perhaps they've started their own bootstrap business and that's something you want to do. Start talking to those or better, easily, easier still, get start finding out who they are and then listen to them on podcasts or read books that they've actually written. And then the other side piece of advice is try and build something yourself so you can learn from that and whether that is starting your own podcast, starting your own website, starting your own blog, starting creating content on LinkedIn, build something yourself, go in with a hypothesis of, what you'd like to get out of it by a three months, six months trial, start doing it and you're going to learn a ton along the way. Even if it doesn't work out, you'll take so many learnings that will be like invaluable. I have one last question for you, Sam. You already shared so much value. This is more of a, let's say, curiosity. You work in B2B SaaS. Uh, I'm curious to know your top three favorite software that you use. That I actually use? Yeah. So what do I use? I use quite a bit. I'm trying to think. Um, there's quite a few tools. I suppose the one I use the most is probably for our podcast. And I don't even know if it's the best because I use StreamYard. We were talking about it before this, actually. But yeah. I use StreamYard to record that. And it has, to be fair for us, it's been consistent at recording. So that's, Perfect. and that just enables us to live stream all the guest interviews for Breaking Me to Be. I suppose the calendar scheduling is like a huge one. Like that's just like a day to day. You don't even think about it, do you? People booking time in your calendar. That's just Calendly that we use at the moment. Um, what else? I'm trying to think of one that's actually a bit different, but putting me on the spot, I don't know if I can think of anything that's that unusual. Opus is one we we use quite a lot at the moment. What is Opus? Like Opus Pro. That oh. is basically with Opus. It's a bit like Veed, if you've heard of Veed edit, editing software, but Opus allows you to chuck in a YouTube video or a, a podcast episode, and then you can specify the duration, like it needs to be under one minute clips, and it'll spit out that video into 10, 20 shorts. But you can specify like from what timings you want to do, if there's any main keywords you want it to include, and it, you can brand it up like with your own branding, your own fonts and all that kind of stuff. It's quite cool to save time to, to make podcast shorts and that kind of stuff. Those are three, but that we use Slack, we use all the, all the well-known ones, Google Suite and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, those are, those are three ones we use all the time. Thank you for sharing that. Is there anything else that you want to say to the audience today on the podcast? I think that's it, really. If, you, if you've if you kind of heard me ramble on about SEO and you want some free resources, you can check out the podcast, Breaking B2B. Or if you go to breakingb2b.com, you can check out our free guides and the newsletter. Um, or if you are kind of ready and, and struggling with organic search or drive leads or demos, then you can book a call, breakingb2b.com. But yeah, appreciate you having me on, Christian. It's been fun. Thank you so much. It was fantastic.